What's happening? Do you see what I do? None of them are moving. They're they're just standing there, hundreds of them, saying nothing, grinning at us with those little eyes of theirs. Can't look. Their faces, their bodies, they're changing. What do we do? We get out of here as fast as our legs will take us. Our mystery drama, Land of the Living Dead, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Don Scardino and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are a few places left in the world that have hardly been touched by the hand of what we call civilization. Where man still lives almost as primitively as at the beginning of time. Such a place can be found in South America on the western plateau of Brazil. It's called the Mato Grosso. Jungles, rainforests, and oppressive swamps cover the land. Two Americans, a young man and his older colleague, are poring over timetables in a small New England town. Maps and charts that lie spread on the floor before them. As it stands, Terry, the morning flight from New York to Rio de Janeiro will just about make the plane connection. Uh, huh. Now, even if we take the commercial flight from Rio to Cuyaba, what kind of transportation can we get into the interior? And I mean transportation that we can depend on, Kent. Well, the answer is probably none. Mm. Not unless we want to go the way of Professor Schneider. (laughs) No thanks. No mules, no native dugouts and snake-infested swamps for me. Right, so we stick to our original plan. We reserve our own airplane in advance in Rio. Mm -hmm. The best and safest in Brazil. And a grant from the foundation is generous. It'll cover all those expenses. <laughs> Besides, it's not as if we didn't know what we're doing. We're both experienced pilots. Right, so we fly ourselves from Rio to Cuyaba, spend whatever time we need there for supplies. Uh-huh. Let's uh, take another look at the charts. Uh, uh, nearly 2,000 kilometers. Uh, it's a good 1,200 miles. Uh, where do we refuel? Right here. Ribeirão Preto. Uh-huh. I think that's how you say it. It's big enough to have an airport. The chart says so. Good. And from there, Kent, it should be clear sailing to Cuyaba. (laughs) We hope. Yeah. After that... Well, once we get past the heaviest jungles and the tropical forests, we shouldn't have any trouble finding places to land, right? If we can avoid the swamps and the quicksands. You know, I have an idea that's what may have happened to Schneider on his last trip. What, quicksand? Mm, How else could he have disappeared so quickly and so completely? Never heard from again. Either that, or... The Indians? No, I don't think so, Kent. Why not? I just don't think so. True, we know almost zero about this strange tribe of Indians we're looking for, but one of the things we do know from Schneider's report of his first trip is that they're relatively peaceful, unwarlike. Mm, Relatively? Well, what have they got to be warlike about? There's no one near them for almost 100 miles. They're vegetarians. The products of the forest are their principal diet. But, Terry... We also know that they're descended from the Hivaros, the the headhunters of Ecuador. The pleasant chaps who would just as soon cut off an enemy's head, your head, Terry, or mine, and shrink it down to the size of a baseball. Mm, But you're forgetting that in the two, three hundred years since some of the Hivaros migrated from Ecuador, something happened to them. They changed. Maybe. That's why we're going there. To find out how they changed. And maybe even why. Mm. You know, that's what makes life so fascinating for anthropologists. The study of the whole human family of man, his mind, his body, his culture. And particularly the study of primitive groups like this one. For me, Terry, there are three things about this expedition of ours that get me excited. Which are? First, the prospect of seeing with my own eyes a whole tribe of white Indians. Just as Professor Schneider described them. A whole community of albino Indians and to try and find out how that came about. Hmm. And second? The possibility of finding some trace, even the slightest, of the missing Professor Schneider. I'm with you on that. Uh, How about the third and last? Well, it would be awfully nice if the both of us get back to civilization alive. When do we leave? (laughs) 
are, Terry. Welcome to beautiful downtown Cuyaba. Will you take a look at that sign over the control tower? <laughs> International Airport of Cuyaba. <laughs> are they kidding? <laughs> they probably have a plane that flies over into Bolivia. Or even Paraguay. Every second Thursday. <laughs> Only if there's a full moon. <laughs> oh, who's the little fellow out there waving at us? Oh, uh, welcoming committee, no doubt. Probably his honor, the mayor. No less. Let's find out. Senores, welcome to Cuyaba, the flower of old Brazil. Didn't I tell you? I present myself, senores. I am Joao Cavallo Figueredo, the third assistant to the mayor of our so beautiful city. Third assistant? Hmm. I guess we don't rate very high, do we? Well, uh, thank you, senor. We uh, certainly appreciate your meeting us. Oh, don't mention it. They have sent to us a radio message from Rio that we were to expect you. How can my city be of service to you? Well, we're headed for the interior, Senor Cavallo. Uh, we'll need a couple of days here to lay in a supply of food and equipment. Oh, of course. You will find that Cuyaba has the best of everything you might possibly need. If, uh, if I may be bold, senores, may I ask where in the interior? Due north. Uh, northwest, maybe. Uh, how far, senor? Oh, not too far. Ah. Uh, Ah, uh, you do not wish to say. <laughs> it's much easier to see by your replies what equipment you will need. Shovels, pickaxes, mining pans, dynamite. Uh, mining pan? Dynamite? The Mato Grosso is very rich. Not only for all minerals, but for diamonds, silver, even platinum. Hmm, is that uh, so? I know what you look for. And I will help. That's very kind of your senor, Cavallo, but... One small word of caution. It's most unlikely you will come upon them, but if you do, do everything possible to avoid them. Avoid who? What? A uh, certain rare tribe of Indians. They live in the rainforests, stark naked, like prehistoric creatures. They... They have in them some strange kind of powerful magic that is able to make a person see most unusual, sometimes most horrible things. And the persons believe that what they are seeing is in truth real. Well, what do they do to work this, uh, this... Thing. Uh, no one has ever found out is a magic that that floats in the air wherever these Indians are. Uh, well, we'll certainly do our best to avoid them, senor. For your own good. But how will we know them if we do come upon them? Well, these are white Indians. Everyone in the tribe, we are told, is an albino, white skin, pink eyes. I must wish that you will never meet them. That's very kind of you, senor. Don't mention it. Your airplane, of course, is in most safe hands, so if you will be so good to follow me, I will drive you to the hotel. In the morning, we start the purchases of supplies for your expedition to this land of most astonishing riches. all that mining stuff we bought. Oh, give it away, throw it away. But I think we did the right thing, Kent. You mean by not giving away the real purpose of our mission? Yeah, somebody might have tried to stop us. And probably would have for our own good. Mm. Then where would we be? Uh, is anything wrong, Kent? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't like the sound of that engine. Neither do I. Uh, look at your navigation charts, Terry. Just about where are we? Uh... Well, there isn't very much on the charts to go by. Well, it, it can't be much further. Well, at this point, with that engine doing tricks, it might be just as well. <laughs> what, what's wrong? What, what on earth is uh, that? I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're falling, Terry. Much too fast. I'm, I'm doing my best to get her up. <laughs> hey, I think you got it, Kent. Here we go. Up, up, up. We're all right? Oh, probably. Oh, funny thing. For a, a second or two back there, I had the uncomfortable feeling that I'd blacked out. Cold. Yeah, so did I. It's odd. Well, what do you suppose that was? It sounded like an airplane crash. 
Well, there can't be a plane near us for hundreds of miles. Oh, well, we better start looking for an opening to land in. Whatever it was. Wherever we are. It's beginning to clear down there. We've left the most tangled part of the jungle behind. Hmm. Oh, that's grass down there. Tall grass. Miles and miles of it. Take her down a little bit more, Kent. Here we go. Uh, you look around, too. For a good spot. Yeah, I am, Kent. I, I think if we... Wait a minute. We just won. Beautiful minute, Kent. Do you see what I see? What? Down there. Uh, over to the left. The left? Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. Well, it's not possible. I think I'm looking at one of the largest, most modern landing fields I've ever seen in my life. That runway is going to be seven, eight thousand feet long, minimum. All those modern buildings and the equipment. What are they doing here in the middle of nowhere? Where the devil are we? Well, there's only one way to find out. Can't switch on your radio. CM5406. We're coming in for landing. Kindly instruct. Okay. Uh, say M cinco cuatro zero seis aproximando a requer permissão para puso. Favor instrume. Still nothing. There's only one other thing to do. Uh, start for your landing, Kent. If, if what we think we're looking at is real, no problem. You're thinking of what Carvalho told us. If we only think the landing field is there, still no problem. The landing will be a bit bumpy, and uh, like Professor Schneider, we'll be known as those two brilliant, those two inspiring, those two missing American anthropologists. Hmm. Fasten your seatbelt, Terry. Real tight. We know that travelers on the desert will sometimes see a lake stretched out before them, where no water exists. Or a seaman will discover the inverted image of a ship in the middle of the ocean. These are what we call mirages. Scientists have explanations, optical illusions. But for some of us, they seem to take on a cold basis in reality, like the airport Terry and Kent have just discovered. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. American scientists are searching for an isolated tribe of South American Indians said to possess a unique power of creating a frightening atmosphere of magic and enchantment. In their small plane flying over a virtually unexplored area of the Brazilian jungle, Kent and Terry suddenly find themselves headed toward a completely modern airport. They prepare for landing. Be sure your seatbelt is fastened tight, Terry. Beautiful landing, Kent. Real proud of you. I'll taxi up to that building over there on the right. Terry, you, you notice anything else uh, a little peculiar about this place? Other than the fact that it's here at all? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Huge, modern airport in the middle of the Brazilian jungle. One o'clock in the afternoon and not a soul, not a single solitary soul in sight. Could it be that this is the time for their siesta? Siesta? At an airport? Can't even down here there'd be somebody in the control tower, a mechanic on the field or near the runway, a baggage loader, somebody. This place is absolutely deserted. I don't get it, Terry. What do we do? <sighs> Only one thing to do. Get out of the airplane, investigate. There's got to be an explanation. Well, the main lobby must be through that gate over there. Well, then that is where we're headed, Kent. I'm with you. Everything's so quiet. I don't hear a thing. Mm. Neither do I. Except our own footsteps. Uh, a big airport like this, you'd expect to hear something. An occasional airplane, or in the jungle, certainly the cries of a tropical bird. Monkeys. Something. Absolutely nothing. That's not a sound. It's as if we... 
Like we were... Go ahead, Ken. Say it. Never mind. Through here to the lobby. Will you take a look at this? It makes every other airport in the world look sick. The ceiling must be ten stories high. One, two, three restaurants. A fancy bar? Oh, and that must be the main gate for arriving passengers. Uh, where? There. Don't you see? Oh. It's marked arrivals in over a dozen languages. Chigada, Arives, Ankumt, Iyigada. Uh, Kent, what's the word for departures in any language? I see what you mean. There is no departure gate. Hmm. It's quite a place. There's just about everything here that you could possibly ask for, except... Except people. No one. Absolutely no one. Hey, here's something interesting. A kind of picture gallery. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of blown-up photographs, all neatly framed, covering the whole wall from ceiling to floor. Just heads. Who do you suppose they are? No idea. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a familiar face. Oh, I know him. That's, uh, that's an actor. A famous British actor, Matinee Idol. I see him every once in a while in an old movie on The Late Show. Yeah, he played Romeo in the first film they ever shot of Romeo and Juliet. Right. Disappeared over the Atlantic at the beginning of World War II. <laughs> You're too young to recognize this man. What, the old fellow? Yeah, a very well-known judge in New York City. Supreme Court, I think. Got mixed up in some kind of scandal. Disappeared overnight. Complete mystery. Oh, now, there's a familiar personality. I heard about her at flying school. Isn't that the uh, great lady aviator? Yeah, the one who was flying solo over the Pacific just before World War II. And who just seemed to vanish into the drink, plane and all? Never heard from again? That's the one. I am beginning to get a very strange message, Kent. Yeah, so am I. Look up there. All those pictures of people who must have lived years and years ago. In clothes of other times, other places. Every race on earth. All those people. They all have one thing in common. All of them are people who disappeared off the face of the earth. Mysteriously, without any credible explanation. But why are there pictures here? Spread out over the walls of this crazy airport. An airport at the end of the world. Don't you know, Kent? <gasps> Don't you know, Terry? Who, who's that? Whose voice is that? Oh, come now, an old friend of both of you. Who, where are you? I don't see anyone. No, of course not. Not yet. I I know that voice. I should hope so. It's Schneider. Professor Schneider. How could that be? Hans Schneider at your service, gentlemen. We hear you, but where are you? Oh, we talk about that later. What are you doing here? Better to ask what we are all doing here. Meanwhile, if you will please both to follow me this way, just follow the sound of my voice. Where are you taking us? Oh, trust me, please. Ah, oh, forgive me. I'm always still so absent-minded. I'm supposed to give you a message. Message? From Lilith. Who? Lilith. I am supposed to say, welcome to you both. We are delighted to have you with us. Us? Who is us? Just follow my voice. You shall soon see. We've been on this godforsaken bus for almost 20 minutes. It keeps on going without even a driver. And we're still no place. Now, you got to calm down, can't you? got to take it easy. There's never been anything like this. That voice, Schneider, or whoever it was told us to get in. We did. Just the two of us into a waiting, empty bus. The bus takes off. Look, look, look over to the right. You see that? We've come to what seems to be some kind of city, a large settlement of some kind. Well, so we have. All of it built around that, that tall building with the funny kind of double spire. Looks almost like a cathedral. We're slowing down. Last stop. Everybody out, I guess. I think that's what they're trying to tell us. What do you suppose that is? Well, we're about to find out. Look at that mob of people pouring out of the tall building. 
hundreds and hundreds of them. Dressed in every conceivable fashion, every period of time. Like a gigantic fancy dress ball. They're all headed toward us. And none of them seems to be speaking. They're all of them absolutely silent. What do we do? I just stand where we are and see what happens. I can't. Look. Right in front. Leading the rest of them. Hans Schneider. Our Hans Schneider. But what's that immediately behind him? I don't know. Some sort of sedan chair. A closed-in platform carried by four men. What or who are they carrying? We are about to find out. Gentlemen, once again, I welcome you to our home. Home? What home? We're in Brazil, Professor Schneider, aren't we? We started out, same as you did, Professor, on a search for albino Indians. Indians of the Mato Grosso. I know, I know. Where are we? I mean, who are these people, and why are they all so silent? Oh, you Americans always so impatient. Oh, we thought you were dead. Well, obviously, as you can see, I am not. And these people, these people who say nothing... Well, here is one who speaks. She wishes to speak to you. They've raised the curtains on the sedan chair. Can you can you see who's sitting in it? Uh, looks like an old man. A very old man. I think it's a very old lady. Oh, you're right, Terry. She looks like one of those ancient Egyptian mummies. Her skin is like wrinkled parchment. She also looks very important. Terry, her lips are moving, but I don't hear anything. Quiet, Kent, please. Kent... Floyd. She knows my name. Terry Bridgewater. And mine. We are honored by your presence, Snyder. You will please leave us. Oh, yes, 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 of course. We will do everything to make you comfortable. That's very kind of you. May we be permitted a few questions? Of course. Uh, we started out on an expedition to locate and study a rare tribe of South American Indians. And uh, instead, you discover us. What happened? Where are we? Who are all of you? So many questions, all at once. This place to which you have come is the land of the missing. The land of the living dead. What? We are those who vanished into the thinnest air from the beginning of creation. We are the missing persons of all time. And this is where you all disappeared too? Yes, all of us. In, in what part of the world are we? In all parts of the world. Every city, every town, every village... In the sky, on mountain tops, in flooded rivers, in the bowels of the earth, at the bottom of the sea. But how long do you all go on living? Forever. Forever? To the end of time. Perpetually. Infinitely. For all... Eternity? You think that is impossible. Not so. But how... Once a day, everyone here enters the temple. And silently we contemplate eternal values. Eternal life. And what do you do there? Conquer death. For us, you see, there is no death. We remain at the same age at which we vanished from the earth. Except for me, since I was the first. The first? I am Lilith. I was the first wife of Adam before there ever was an Eve. When Adam created Eve, there was no place for me. And so I somehow disappeared in a cloud of mystery. I see. Lilith, may I ask what the meaning is of that curious ornament you wear about your neck? This? This rough little figure of gold? Yes, it looks like a small figure eight, about half an inch long, lying on its side. It's very beautiful. Everyone here seems to have one. That is our mark. Our symbol of eternity. 
of infinity, of the endlessness of time. Gentlemen, I have grown tired. If you will excuse me, I must rest now. Gary, we've got to get out of this place, but fast. We've got to find our way back to our airplane. How do we do that? I'm not sure, but we've got to try. I couldn't agree with you more. We've wandered into some kind of madhouse. I can't explain what's happening. Missing persons, people who have become immortal. Professor Schneider? Schneider is dead. He's got to be. Slowly, Kent. We've got to find our way out of here before we both become as crazy as they are. Oh, I am with you. Jerry, Kent, you are not thinking of leaving. Uh, Professor Schneider... Well, Lilith asked me to give one of these to each of you. The little gold ornament. The horizontal figure eight. Our symbol of infinity, of eternity. Well, that's very kind of Lilith. But no thanks. We wouldn't have any use for them. Oh, but we all wear them. Now that you both have become part of us, so must you. Over 800 years ago, a Persian poet and mathematician, Omar Khayyam, wrote, There was the door to which I found no key. There was the veil through which I might not see. Two anthropologists, in their effort to probe into some of the most ancient secrets of mankind, have come to a door to which, at the moment, they find no key. To a drawn curtain beyond which they cannot see. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The word missing can be a terrifying word. Missing in action, for example, is a sad and all too familiar phrase. Almost every large city in the world has a bureau of missing persons whose task it is to try to unravel the often bewildering mystery of a human's disappearance. Kent Floyd and Terry Bridgewater are, at the moment, doing everything possible to find their way back into a world they know. We can stop running, Kent. Please, I, I, I don't think I can go much further. We've got to keep going, Terry. But nobody's following us. Nobody's even tried to prevent us from leaving. And did you stop to think why? Why they didn't try to stop us? Oh, at this point, does that matter? If only we could be sure we were headed in the right direction. I have a feeling that once we get past that clump of trees over there... Oh, yeah, Kent, you're right. There it is, the airport. Hey, I'm sitting right there, CM-5406. Our airplane. Oh, the place is just like when we landed. Not a soul in sight. Absolutely deserted. Now, well, let's get into that plane and fast. Uh, and out of this place forever. Oh, isn't that one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen in your life? Uh, here we are. In you go, Terry. Uh, right. Uh, and here we go. Well, nothing's been touched. Isn't that wonderful? Looks okay. Get us started, Kent. Try it again. All right, let me let me check everything. Let's see now. Well, what's wrong? Why does that catch? They've done something with the engine. Oh, but what? That's what I'm trying to find out. Why doesn't this damn thing turn over? Oh, there we go. Whew, thank heavens. Maybe we're both overreacting. Oh, maybe. And away we go. <laughs> but where to? Any place. As long as it's away from here. Now, how's our supply of fuel? And what's our course? Oh, we've more than enough fuel to... What's the matter? The fuel gauge. It, it's not working. Well, what about the rest of the panel? Nothing. No, everything's dead. But even my watch has stopped. Yeah, mine too. What do we do? We keep going. As long as we can. Yeah, on what course? What direction? Well, we'll have to depend on our memory and our good sense, I hope, of navigation. And maybe, uh, pray a little? Oh, it can't hurt. But I have a feeling that tells me we're on course or very close to it. And if we're not? If we're not, Terry, praying a little won't be quite enough. 
not quite. Any sign yet of anything? My guess is we've been flying about an hour. We've got to come to something soon. Brazil's a big country. Hmm. Isn't that the truth? Terry, have you any explanation? Uh, what's been happening to us? No, my friend, it's beyond me. A modern airport in the middle of nothing. A strange city, stranger people, thousands of them. The missing persons of the entire world of all time. Calling themselves immortal. Where we were expecting to find Indians. What I can't understand is what's been happening to us. Our instruments not functioning. Our watches stopped. How? Why? You don't suppose that... Suppose what? Remember what Carvalho told us back in Cuyaba? About the Broncos Indians? You mean about their strange power of enchantment that makes people see things that aren't really there? That's exactly what I mean. Wait, this is the 20th century. The idea of that kind of, of witchcraft, of voodoo, call it what you like, was exploded years ago. We're educated men, and there just ain't no such thing. Uh, still can't put what Schneider told us out of my mind. When he gave us those little gold figure eights to wear around our necks. Now that you both have become part of us, he said. So? Could it be possible that... that we... That we what? That we have become a part of them? How could that be? Uh, uh, Kent, look. Straight ahead. An airport. We're coming to an airport. It looks familiar. Uh, are the instruments working? Not yet. Well, that could be uh, uh, Ribero uh, Preto or whatever it was called. Where we refueled on our way to Cuyaba. You're right. Ah. Oh. Kent, I don't know how you did it. You're some kind of genius. Whoa, get ready for landing. Oh, the way. Wait just a minute. What? What is it? That's not Ribeiro Preto down there. Look again. No. Oh, no. How on earth did we ever get here? We've been flying in a circle. We're back where we started from. That's their airport. Turn back, Kent. Turn the plane around. Don't trouble to try. <gasps> Professor Schneider. Of course. He's right. I can't turn it around. Gentlemen, gentlemen, where have you been? We all missed you. Again, only your voice. Just your voice. We can't see you. Does it matter? What do you want of us? I? I want nothing. But she would like to have a word with you. Both of you. She? Lilith. Our Lilith. Prepare to land. Lilith is not the kind of person you make wait. But why? Why should you want to leave us? Tell Lilith why. Because we don't belong here. That's why. You don't? We have our lives to live, and if you don't mind, we prefer not to live them here. We're scientists. We have important work to do. Ah, uh, the exact words I said when I first arrived. You must try to understand, both of you. You remember when you were flying here on your way from Cuyaba? Yes. You heard a strange sound. Like an explosion, like an airplane splintering, crashing into bits. What you heard was your own airplane plummeting to earth into the wilds of the jungles of Brazil. What? Neither it nor either of you will ever be heard from again. So relax both of you. Don't waste your time trying to leave us. Your life is here forever. We can't accept that. You will, my friend. Gentlemen, the time has come. Time for what? For your first experience in contemplation. 
contemplation of eternal values, of eternal life. Now, if you will both breathe deeply, deeply, and try to believe, believe. Terry, what's happening? Look at those mobs of people coming out of the temple. Hundreds of them. And once they come out and take their places, none of them moves. They just stand there like so many stone statues, grinning at us with faces that look like masks. Ah, and look, Terry, their clothes. Their, their clothes are starting to disappear. They're almost all of them naked. And their bodies, they're changing too. They're, they're becoming Indians. Albino Indians. The Broncos we started out to find. And Schneider. Look at Schneider. He's trying to get our attention. He's holding something in either hand. They look like... Uh, no. What are they? They're dead human heads, Terry. Shrunk down to the size of an apple. He's holding them by the hair. How horrible. What their ancestors, the Hivaros, did to unfriendly neighbors. <sighs> look at those two faces, Terry. One of those heads is mine. And the other is mine. We've got to get out of here. Snyder, get us out of here. Get us out! Oh, I never thought we'd make it. Why do you suppose Schneider let us escape? Maybe he felt sorry for us. Maybe he knew that our lives and our sanity depended on it. Who knows? But something did give us that extra boost of adrenaline we needed. The main thing now, Terry, is that... Terry. What? What is it? How long would you guess we've been in the air? Well, let's see. It's a uh, uh, quarter past... Kent! My watch is going again. So's mine. And look at the instrument panel. Yeah. Everything's working. I'm going to try the radio. CM 5406 calling. Calling anyone, anywhere. Radio and instruments have not been functioning. Come in, anyone. We request our position. Over. CM 5406. CM 5406. Oh, isn't that beautiful? You are 12.6 nautical miles south of west of Cayo Airport. Cayo. That's the control tower in Rio de Janeiro. We're approaching Rio. Runway 4 is clear. Please use runway 4. Thank you. Roger. Terry, look. There's Sugarloaf over on our left. And Guanabara Bay. And there's the Christ of the Andes. Terry, we're back. Back in Rio. Alive. And in one piece. <laughs> That tall, rangy-looking gal, the, the one with the close-cropped sandy hair? She's coming toward us. The one with the slacks and the white open-neck shirt? Hmm. She looks familiar. What is she one of us? Well, I guess we're about to find out. Terry Bridgewater? Uh, yes. Kent Floyd? That's me. I was sent here to the airport to meet you. Well, how do you do? Hello? Uh, may we know who sent you? We were beginning to worry about you. You were? Uh, why is that? Who are we? Yeah, who are you, miss? Um... And how do you know us? Why should you meet our airplane? Oh, so many questions all at once. I'm glad to see you're both wearing that little gold figure eight. How do you know about that? I've been wearing mine for a long time. See? I... I know your face. Just who are you? Haven't I seen your picture someplace before? That's quite possible. Who are you? My name is Amelia. Amelia? Not the one who disappeared over the South Pacific in her own plane? In 1937. Great mystery. No one's ever explained it. Well, then what are you doing here? Isn't this Rio? It's any place you want it to be. Rio, Hong Kong, Cairo, the middle of the Brazilian jungle, Detroit. Any place. We're all of us. Among the missing. We're all of us in the land of the living dead. Please, follow me. 